All right, my friends, welcome back to the virtual press event for Den. And I'm Gene Della Sala, and we have two very special guests. We got Phil Jones from Sound United slash Denon, and we got Jake Mendel. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Awesome. Doing great, Gene. Doing great. You know, I'm excited that you guys are doing this unveiling on our channel. I'm very honored by it. You guys have a lot to talk about, man. You guys have been kicking butt with your receivers. You've been adding features that first to market in many uh, for Den, and it's kind of a Den in heritage ever since I've been following the brand back in the old days with the 5803 and the 4802s. You guys have always kind of led the technology front, and today you have three amazing features in your entire product line that so far no other manufacturer or competitor have. So I'd like you guys to just kind of give us a rundown of what the X series is going to be like in 2020. Okay. So, um, so first let's introduce ourselves. So let me, um, let me bring up a, a slide here. So everybody knows who they're talking to. So hi. Um, so my name is Phil Jones and joining me is Jake Mendel. Jake is the brand manager. He looks like he's 12, but no, he <laughs> is the brand manager. I think that's his high school graduation picture. But um, but Jake is, <laughs> Jake is the um, global brand manager for Denon. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our new 2020 um, uh, Denon X series receivers. So I'm going to actually let Jake um, uh, talk real quickly about the lineup as well as the um, the models that will be in the lineup. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you guys, everybody. Thank you for joining. We're super excited to have you guys here. We're excited announcing to you and having you guys be the um, some of the first receivers of this information. It's incredibly exciting for Denon and our team. Um, so with that, we're really excited to be bringing four new X-Series um, AVRs to the line. Uh, we will be replacing these with the AVR X2700H, the AVR X3700H, the AVR X4700H, and the AVR X6700H. Uh, these will be pricing varied between 849 to 24.99 uh, across the four models. What we're really, really excited about this is that Denon is continuing to lead this legacy at first. They're continuing to lead this um, this heritage of being the first in the industry uh, with things like Dolby Atmos coming, uh, being the first AVR to have Dolby Atmos or the first AVR to, to promote Oro 3D. So we kept that heritage and that route going and we're really, really excited to have um, these AVRs all four promote um, 8K60 and 4K120 HDMI pass-through, as well as 8K upscaling across the board. Um, another thing that we're really, really excited about for our AVR um, series with the X6700H is supporting a brand new audio codec, which will be DTSX Pro. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I'm looking at your table matrix here. And so Oral 3D starts, Oral 3D starts now on the 4700 model, right? Yes, so we yes. brought that down to the 47, so it will be covering off on the um, X4700 as well as the X6700H. Okay. Okay. Now, um, now Jake will mention, um, why don't you talk a little bit about what we brought, the basic stuff that we brought down that, were, that was available in the models we introduced in 2019. Yeah, of course. So with the models that we introduced with the, uh, in 2019, such as the AVR X um, 3600H, uh, we brought in a lot of features like Dolby Atmos height virtualization, um, Bluetooth transmission to any of your Bluetooth headphones, AirPlay disable, as well as being considered room tested. So we took that new technology that was um, implemented in our 2019 models and not implemented with the newer higher end models and actually brought it into the 22, uh, 2020 models. So all of those, um, the new X series line, all feature things such as Dolby Atmos height virtualization, rune tested, um, et cetera. Awesome. Oh, so so um, the big thing is that a, a lot of times we we made some really new cool additions to our receivers that we entered, that we introduced in the um, last year at the price point below sixteen hundred dollars. And but people kept saying, "Man, I really wish that you made a higher end model with all of those particular features." So now you get all of those in the new twenty twenty X series models um, at this year. So that's kind of a great thing. But as Jake mentioned, we are actually bringing in a lot of um, first. Um, Denon has always been first. If you think about, we were the first ones to come with um, Atmos, the DTSX, and RL 3D, and IMAX Enhanced. The fact that we're the first AVR available with um, HDMI 2.1 capabilities, like 8K and high frame rate and all that stuff is huge. And the fact that we're the first AVR 
that has the new DTSX Pro. Um, so we're bringing that new technology down is actually a really, really cool thing. So Phil, do you want to talk about what DTS Pro is all about? I think we should just spend some time under, having the reader understand what they're getting with DTSX Pro, the compatibility, backwards compatibility, that kind of stuff. What is this okay. all about? Okay. Well, the first thing is because we are social distancing and you're way on the east coast and i'm way on the west coast we actually have the receiver set up along with the menu system so ta-da um this is the new um denon um uh 6700 so if you look at the cosmetics it's it's similar um than to this year it's still very clean there are new logos which is like i said the imax enhance which we're going to talk about so let me actually open that back up open so let's go through and talk about the uh the feet the newer features um, because it was a great receiver, even if we didn't add all these new enhancements. So the first thing, DTSX Pro. So uh, the, the older processors that were found in the common uh, receivers, except for super, super, super high-end um, uh, processors like a Trenoff, were limited to 11.1. Um, now, because of DTSX Pro, that limitation is, is no longer there. So depending on the processor and um, that you use and the uh, amplifier comp capabilities that you have in your AVR, you can go all the way up to 30, 30.2 now, um, which is which is huge. And the big thing is you don't need new DTSX content because this is an object-based system, not a channel-based system. So all that DTSX content you have immediately will work in DTSX Pro. You can now just have more speakers um, and more um, that you can utilize to get more out of it. So that content will continue to grow. So if you end up being some crazy guy with 30.2 um, in 10 years, um, you don't have to replace that disc that you, just, that you already purchased. So is there going to be um, specific software coming down the pipe that's in DTSX Pro? Yeah, everything you own right now. You go grab your DTSS demo disc right now. It is in DTSX Pro. Uh, remember, the, the way that it works, we have to look at um, uh, how the system works. Before, whenever there was an upgrade, um, we were upgrading channel-based surround sound solutions, 5.1 to 7.1 to 9.1. So we're all so each time that you wanted more chan um, more uh, more channels, it required a whole new mix because the engineer mixes that sound from one speaker to another speaker and to another speaker, and he pans stuff back and forth, almost like you do stereo. If I want something to be sound like it's in between my left rear and my left front, if I put it equally in those two channels, just like in stereo, it will appear like it's coming from the middle. But that was a manual process of panning channels. Object based does not work like that. What happens is the engineer assigns an object, a location in space. That object is over here. A size. Is it a, is it a small bell or a Mack truck or the thunderclap that just washes across the entire room, and then how diffuse of that sound is that sound? Is it really defined like bell, or is it like a wide, wide wash of a crowd? So once he determines those information, that is actually what goes into the track, and your and your um your the render in your receiver utilizes the channels or the speakers that you have connected to try to put that object at that location, at, th at that proper size with that type of diffusion. The mix is basically, the reason why object-based content like DTSX and Atmos is backwards compatible is think of it has, so this is kind of an example. Um, uh, Atmos has about 128 objects. What they do is um, for 9.1 is they take the first nine objects and make them fixed in the location where you would have a 9.1 system. Then they take the other 118 objects and they whiz them around the room. So those the green dots on the one side that you see is the um, um, is all of the objects they can they can select. The middle is basically the speaker layout in the room that they were mixing in, and the right side, the far side, is the um, what those objects are. The darker the object, the louder it is. The more, the wider the object, the uh, the uh, the bigger the size, and the and the harder the edge, the more of the focus. So by moving these around, literally with a joystick, I put them in positions, and then your system utilizes the speakers that it has to 
to uh, to put that object in your room the best way possible. So no new content is required. There is going to be no new DTS Pro content. It's just DTS X content. But if you have a Pro processor, you have more channels you can utilize. Gotcha. Is there any advantage to using the DTS X up mixer, even for like an Atmos soundtrack or for an oral soundtrack? Do you think there's because you could cross mix these, right? I mean, you could actually use the up mixer, not just for DTS material. Exactly. Um, it, we always say our goal at, at Denon is to give you options. We're not here to tell you what up mixer works best, what surround sound platform is best. We want to make sure you, we give you the options. So that's why we give you Oral 3D, DTSX, Adobe Atmos, all these different options, IMAX Enhance. So you, you're, you can choose for yourself. But if you look at the, the receiver, uh, in the receiver you have a renderer. If I feed it DTSX content, the which is object-based, the renderer will take that object-based material, look at how many channels that are available and where those channels are located and put that object in space. If I have an, a mix that is um, channel-based, like regular DTS or DTS HD, I can, the um, NeuroX, the new NeuroX up mixer will take that and up mix it to the amount of speakers that you have. You also have the ability to take something that is non-DTS, like PCM that I find a lot coming out of my off of my Apple TV when I'm not using Atmos, and I can upmix that via NeoRx and still utilize those speakers. Um, so it just gives you the ability to to um, to to uh, choose the um, a, a new and higher performance uh, upmixer for two channel or so one or so one channel. thing. Uh, one thing I do want to ask, and you probably don't know the answer to, we could follow up with DTS, is did they make any updates to their up mixer for two channel? Because that's, I've always found that to be the weakest link for mixing music up to the DTS X up mixer. I'm wondering if they made some enhancements there since they have so much more processing capability now to have like a music mode, something like that, you know? Um, that's a good question. Um, Jake could probably yeah. reach out to them and see um, what if they've made any additional changes to um, uh, its music mode. But we have solutions for that, which we'll we talk about that will allow you to fully customize um, a multi a, uh, a two channel up mix this around music mode to make it exactly um, yep. what you want. So sure. so. Um, the other thing that we could talk about is if you think about IMAX Enhanced, um, IMAX Enhanced is actually the basis of IMAX Enhanced is DTSX. So because now I have more channels of processing, um, now I have even more capability from my IMAX Enhanced content. And I know what a lot of you guys are going to say, how much IMAX Enhanced content is out there? Well, what Sony just announced that they're going to be releasing a huge amount, like 100 movies in IMAX Enhanced. So the content is going to start to come. Now, when you go to a movie theater, the, uh, the mixes, the, there's a different mix depending on what type of IMAX theater you go to. IMAX theaters are a 12.0 mix at the top, the very best ones, which means there is no LFE. There is no point one. Every channel is full range, which is why it has a different sound than if you go to a normal theater. So there's subwoofers for all 12 channels, which is frightening, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, in, and also there's seven surround speakers along the horizon, and then there's five height speakers, front, back, um, fr um, front, back, and center height, because just remember the screen is so massive. So it's actually a seven point, it's actually 7.5, Point zero, actually 7.0.5, the way yeah, that we yeah. normally utilize or no, the way we normally discuss it. So based on the original mix that IMAX used to mix that movie, the IMAX and Hats bitstream will utilize that um, in different ways. So for example, the 12.0, you get a 7.1.4 and this a, preser a, a, preser a, a center front height channel now that you can actually utilize similar to the center front height you would see in an oral 3d so okay, you get so a lot somebody of I, i've been getting a lot of questions about the 8500 like this one mm -hmm. for example um uh, is dts x pro going to be supported on the 8500 or does it require firmware or hardware upgrade well the uh the brand of the 8500 is is it's very smart so yes the 8500 will be upgradable to dtsx pro 
Um, there's also a benefit. You go, well, why would I? There's a benefit also from stepping up from a 67 to an 8500, which I'll show you in a second. So, okay. and that actually comes to, has to do with the speaker layouts as we continue on. So, so real quick, real quick, Phil, about the base yeah. management of, I just want to make sure everybody understands this, even though IMAX enhanced in the movie theater has full range channels all around and no dedicated sub channel, the implementation at home is actually going to be base managed because that's exactly. what you want in a home. Exactly. You want base management. You want it to have multi-sub. Exactly, because the best way to think about it, if they sent that mix to your speakers, it would probably blow them up. Um, yeah. People think their speakers are full range, but even the, I have a pair of Wilson Watt puppies. They don't go down to 20. They don't. Yeah. So and especially my center channels and my surrounds and everything else. <clears throat> so they run a lot more bass and a lot more volume with a much more aggressive mix in, a, in, a, in an IMAX theater. So how do you get that impact utilizing the 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 limited um, range, not, I mean, they're not, I mean, we, even if you have a good floor standing speaker, they know they don't go all the way down. So how do I get the most impact from my floor standards in my house that don't have five 18 inch subwoofers in it and my center channel and my rear. So they, so there's a base management. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a, there's a base. Um, um, there's also some base treatment done um, and, and, and stuff like that. Now the cool thing is there are some things when you bought IMAX enhanced on most receivers um, when they came out, they would make ev they would take every speaker and they would give it a mandatory crossover of seventy to make sure you don't hurt your stuff. Um, mm -hmm. If you're crazy, if you have like us, we make these big BP ninety towers, ninety eighties. I want those can play lower than seventy, so we actually have the option of going in and adjusting the high pass and low pass on your speakers if you actually do have something that can play a little lower. Gotcha. Yep. They have built-in powered subs, basically. Exactly. But it, but the only way you see those settings, by the way, if you go into your receiver you, this year and next year, you're not going to see those settings unless you are playing a piece of IMAX content. Because the receiver says, you don't need to see these because you don't have any IMAX stuff. So gotcha. the second I, so if I want to see those mo the, all of that stuff, um, the crossover settings and all that stuff, I have to be paying, playing a piece of IMAX content. And magically, you'll see more settings in your menu. Okay. Understood. Okay. You were going to show something about the IMAX speaker layouts and I cut okay. you off. So. Okay. But that, that was a good question because I know everybody asks us about that all the time. The, uh, the next thing is um, because remember we talked about they have that center height, is that, cent that uh, center front height. Well, that actually exists. So what you'll end up with is you will have the uh, center front height capabilities um, in your, um, on, on your receiver. So if the Neuro X uh, up mixer is off, um, you will um, natively there's a center height there. So now I can have a, a, a regular height um, height speed, a regular center channel and a center front height. This is great because TVs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. An 85 inch TV with a center channel way below it, there is a disconnect. I have a 75 inch TV, but and my center channel was probably three feet below the center of that screen. So it is detached. When I run my projection screen, my 120, the voice is detached from the uh, where it should be on the screen. And having a, a center above and a center below allows them to lock these, the, the vocals onto your screen. Or if I decide I want King Kong to be nine feet tall, I can make him come out of that center height. It's a creative, it's a, it, that center front height. That's a, that's a creative choice. So that is a mix, that is up to the IMAX mix. So that's a benefit to that. If I so turn, just just mm -hmm. to be clear about the center front height, this is not a parallel center output. You're not running nope. exact same signals because you'll get massive no. acoustical interference if you do nope. that. It's a separate yeah. channel, right. separate object, and it's up to the it's up to the content creator on how they utilize that um, that separate height channel. Sometimes they may mix some of the same things into both of them to lock it on your screen. Sometimes they may make uh, make something different on both to make to give you a, a wider sense of height or scope. Gotcha. Um, and then lastly, um, if you have the Neural X on, um, you can also utilize a top surround, similar to the voice of God found on the RO3D layout. Oh, okay. So what you recommend the same kind of, or DTS recommends the same kind of positioning where the voice of God uh, speaker would be for RO3D? Yes, they, they do. Um, if, if we look at the next um, slide here, um, they, this is kind of the options you get. So if so you had a 6700. Um, and that has that 
a 6700 has 11 channels of amplification, but 13.2 channels of amp of um, of processing. So you can have 13.2, 13 speakers and two subwoofers connected um, by utilizing external amplification, a, a secondary amplifier. Which, by the way, um, we are going to go into the menu system of this of this receiver right now. When we get done with this conversation, I'll show you how this is done. Okay, so. So you can actually go in and you can set it up for Dolby Atmos. And, and that would be, you know, 7.2.6 with a pair of front heights, a pair of rear heights, and a top middle, either in ceiling or, you know, traditional height speaker pointing down. Now, the, then, or I can set up for an Aural 3D configuration, which has um, um, front heights, rear heights, a center front height, and a voice of God. And that same configuration also can be applied to DTSX Pro and IMAX Enhance. So you could set up the, the Dolby Atmos way with the, with the uh, top middles or the Oral 3D slash DTSX Pro slash IMAX Enhanced way with the center height and the top surround. This is a bit mind boggling, man. Just looking at all these different speaker configurations. It's crazy. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the one thing people ask us a lot is, well, I, I, I want to use the Atmos one when I play Atmos, and I really want to use this other one for the Oral 3D and the IMAX and the DTSX Pro. But on a 6700, I have to fit this only third there's only a, a um, 13 speaker, actually. 11 speaker terminals plus an amplifier. So I'm limited to 13. So I can't have both combinations. If you buy a um, X8500, an X8500 has 13 channels of amplification, but 15 speaker terminals. So mm -hmm. I can switch from the Dolby Atmos configuration uh, and play that and then go into the menu and hit and, and, and press a button and then switch a few buttons and switch over to the Oral 3D and the DTS Pro. So I can have both options um, because, of, and that's one of the reasons why you would step up to an 8500. So you guys need to make this auto switching when it detects the signal. If it's DTS X Pro, it should go to that speaker layout versus uh, <laughs> Dolby, Dolby Atmos. Yeah, Come Jake, on. Tell, tell, you're going to wait modify. for the 8900. Me... You're going to wait for the 8900s on that. Tell your modifier. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. send this one back to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um so now um the big thing we want to get across, people say, well, what if I don't get a chance to optimize um um what you said right there that I actually had to pick, right? So if we if we looked here, you said that I have to pick on a 6700 between the Atmos and layout, the Adobe Atmos layout and the DTSX Pro layout. Well, what, how is that going to affect it when I switch between formats if I pick just one of the two? Because I only I pick option A, how is that going to affect my sound when I play option B? Or if I pick option B, how is it going to affect my sound when I pick option A? The thing you have to remember is both of these systems are object-based. And they're, and um, so, for example, the, uh, the DTSX is object-based, but you have – it's really – the, it's optimized for basically not 30, 32.30.2 point, 30 speakers, but also about 30.2 positions or 30 mm -hmm. positions where you can put the speakers. If you look at Dolby Atmos, it is um, it supports up to um, up to 20 uh, up to basically 35. So one does if you take out the LFE, one has 30 channels of, of surround positions and one has 34 channels of surround positions. And if you look at those positions, they're pretty similar. So the only one you do not see on the Dolby Atmos layout is a center height and a top surround. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if I use the if I use the Dolby Atmos configuration for DTSX Pro, those positions pretty much align with the positions that you would find on um, DTSX Pro. So if you pick the Adobe Atmos one, it's still gonna sound great if you play uh, DTSX Pro. Gotcha, yeah. And I would imagine people would choose a, a format that's compatible with both like this because 90% of the time you're gonna be using Atmos anyways. That's exactly. where most of the content's coming from. Exactly, so this is 7.1.4. And now they look different because in I'm um, Adobe Atmos always shows the picture of the couch with it um, pulled back closer to the rears. 
and IMAX and DTS X and IMAX always shows the couch dead center. If you look at the Adobe Atmos layout, it gives you a variation of angles. So the center can, the front can be between 30 and 22. If I push that couch forward, that angle becomes 30, which is identical to the DTSX one, which is what? 30. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, so there's some, um, so yeah, you're going to get great sound. Don't panic. I mean, my, my buddy, my buddy, John, uh, John, um, uh, Heron at Trenoff wants you to put all 90 speakers in the hot room because he makes a, you know, because he makes the uh, the Trenoff piece and you can drink your, you know, your Don Perignon and, and drive your Lambo to your theater with 90 speakers in it because it, it could do that type of stuff. But the average consumer that buys this receiver is going to get the best sounding surround sound performance from both of those formats, you know, if they just put the speakers pretty much um, this, um, where they will fit in their home. We're just happy what, if the we're just happy if the majority of people buying these receivers use it beyond five point one. To be honest, exactly, with you. <laughs> exactly. Well, so, what's great about that too is with the Trinov piece, it it's like a seven eight thousand dollar unit. Um, the AVRX sixty seven hundred is going for about twenty four ninety nine. Yeah, so you're looking at seven grand plus amplifiers plus how many other speakers you're going to need for that. Yeah. So you're going. Yep. So you're looking at you're looking at an investment that is attainable for most. To something that is for the very elite. So not everybody, good. not everybody's a high roller like like Shane from Spare Change, man. He's a high roller. He's a high roller. Yeah, I, I, yeah Shane, we're gonna be talking about. Uh, believe yeah. me, my friend John, it's 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 stunning. But it's like comparing, you know. But you know, that's not our goal is to bring great sound to the wide majority of people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, and then sometimes, but, and there's always going to be someone that wants to bring it to the absolute pinnacle, but the pinnacle cost is not attainable to most people. Yeah. So, okay. So I want to talk about a feature that really the most exciting feature to me on your new lineup. And I have to toot my own horn because I've been bugging you guys for a while about this. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm a little bit peeved. You didn't give me credit for it in your press release, but whatever. Um, the preamp mode is, is to me a real game changer for somebody that wants to buy a receiver and then have future expandability and to use it in a way that would benefit for having external amplification, to have a really clean preamp signal like you're buying a dedicated processor. And, and let me just show everybody why I'm so excited about this. So last, about a year and a half, two years ago, I reviewed the Marantz SR8012, which is a phenomenal receiver. It's still in my family room system. I love this receiver to death. Um, and it puts out four volts RMS out of the preamp out. So you guys have always, Denon and Marantz have always given really solid preamp outputs. They've never clipped at a volt and a half like some of the other manufacturers do. But I go beyond just looking at distortion uh, or just looking at clipping. I actually look at FFTs to see the distortion profile of a preamp output. And this is the SR8012 at one volt. And you can see it's really clean. You know, there's some higher order third harmonic here, but it's still like 90 dB below the fundamental, which is excellent, very inaudible. Mm -hmm. But when you drive the, uh, the receiver beyond a volt, 1.2 volts, I found the distortion went up 20 dB on the third harmonic. Mm -hmm. And that puzzled me because I saw this not only, this is not only a Sound United problem, this is any amplifier or any receiver manufacturer that basically their amplifiers reach full power at about a volt and a half. Mm -hmm. So if you're not using those amps, they're disconnected. When you're cranking the volume up, and it usually takes about two volts RMS to reach full output of a external amplifier that has a, a traditional gain structure of like 29 dB. Mm -hmm. And what happens is those amplifiers are clipping mm -hmm. and the distortion from those clipping amplifiers are feeding back into the preamps. So the only way to avoid this is to have a preamp disconnect to actually mm -hmm. physically break the path from the amplifier to the preamplifier. Mm -hmm. and I'm happy to say <clears throat> that's what you guys are doing now, not just with the 8500, but now for every model on these new X series that have a preamp output, you have a preamp disconnect. That's mm -hmm. incredible foresight. I know you guys are, I appreciate you, first of all, for listening to me and taking mm -hmm. constructive criticism, but you're also leading the way now because 
back in the day when we did the buy amp mode, I was the first one that Jerry rigged a 3805 and a 5803. <laughs> and that led a revolution for, for every manufacturer to do buy amp mode. You guys are going to lead a revolution again with the receivers. You're going to have this preamp mode on your entire X series line. And I'm sure your buddies at Yamaha are going to do the same in the next generation, followed by Pioneer, Akio, and everybody else. Mm -hmm. So why don't we talk a little bit yeah. about that? People okay. are, you know, they have well, questions what's, about what's it. What's nice about, about it, Gene, is you just sold it. <laughs> I don't have to talk about what the benefit of it is, you know, because you just sold it. But um, but what ends up happening is we had preamp mode, if you switch back to me, on our X8500. And and like I said, that was because people want to want that. Not, um, one, it really, it gives you a upgrade path. So you can start off with an amazing receiver, and then you can go out and buy a multi-channel or a bunch of amplifiers and turn that unit into a pre-amplifier. But remember, once you buy an amplifier, it's buy once, cry once. So now, yes. normally what usually ends up happening is the things that need to be upgraded is the brain. Video switching, new surround sound formats. But once you buy a bunch of big, bad amplifiers, you'll never have to buy them again. So now, you start off with the receiver, you turn into a preamp, you buy your amps. That's your upgrade path. And then the next time you need a new brain, instead of buying a receiver, you could buy a preamp. So, and like you said, it it helps. It gives you a cleaner signal. Um, you have less clipping. Um, it's a great, it's a really, really, really good, um, great solution. Now, a little later, I'm going to actually go into the menu after we talk about the next topic. Actually, let's do it right now, actually, um, since we're talking about how to go in and do, and do preamp mode. So what happens is I actually have a 6700 here. I stole it from Jake. If he, I went to the warehouse last a couple of days ago, and I took it. So this is actually his sample. So this is pretty much the first one anybody's seen. I don't even think Jake has seen it since he hasn't been since the last time he was in Japan. When that's serial working. number one. So that's serial <laughs> this number is one. Serial number. Enjoy this it, man. Serial number number one. Okay. So let's go in here and show you how to use this. So what I did was I put a camera up so you can actually see the menu system. So. So normally, I'm, in, I'm going to the menu system, you, uh, and I'm going to do this manually, but you have the thing called Amp Assign, right? If I mm -hmm. go into Amp Assign, and that will ask you um, what type of um, layout do you have? So Amp Assign, oops, going to go back in here again. I can, it'll say, what do you have? And I can say, I have a 11 channel, I have a 13 channel. So you go in and you make your predictions. Then if I go in, I hit preamp, you'll see all those pre's jump up. It's mm -hmm. all or nothing. So when you hit preamp mode, it physically disconnects all the amplifiers. So right. if you have a 5.1, 5. 5, 5. you need a five channel amp. If you have a 13.1, um, you're going to need more amplification to do that. Um, so and when you go into preamp mode, it's, a, it's an all or nothing proposition. But it's as simple as going into the amp assign and switching it on and off. So two things I like to keep that slide up while I talk. Two things I like to address to people. What's cool about this too is if you go into preamp mode, if you decide the amplification in the receiver is not enough and you want to have separate amps, you get mm -hmm. Emotivas, Outlaw, Mono Price, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I would switch the receiver from auto eco to mm -hmm. always on eco mm -hmm. because you're not using the amplifiers at all, but they're still idling. They're still mm -hmm. turned on. So they're still mm -hmm. dissipating quiescent current and they're dissipating mm -hmm. power. Yeah. By going to eco auto, it brings the rail voltage down. So you're dissipating less heat because let's face it. A lot of these receivers like the new Denon and Marantz's, they run mm -hmm. hot because you've yes, got nine, do. you got nine, 11, 13 channels in a, in a chassis that was really sized for seven or nine channels, you know, mm -hmm. back in the day. So you're dissipating that heat. You can cut your heat and save your energy by running eco on when you're running yes. preamp mode, or does it does it automatically go eco on when you do preamp? I, mode I think I think it. I have I haven't checked it. Um, let's let's look here. So that's uh, something Yamada might want to consider. That yeah. if you put it in preamp mode, it should automatically, automatically go, go to, to eco, eco. Go to eco, eco yeah. on. Yeah. Eco on. Yeah. So if I go. So back, another cool an, another cool thing I thought about last night with this preamp mode, um, you could conceivably hook up a 5.1 or 7.1 speaker system in another room connected exactly. to the yep yeah connected to the amplifiers of this receiver mm -hmm. okay yeah, and when then you when you that. yeah when you so that, you could know. you could conceivably have processing in another room by turning the preamp mode off and then turning your main amplifier um, yeah. off 
yeah. just two switches and boom, you can have processing yeah. in two different rooms from one receiver. That's yes, pretty and, cool. And we have a feature that you can do it from the press of a button on the remote or discrete code. So yeah, like you said, you could take your 6700, use the power to power like your in ceilings in your den that's playing next to your kitchen and have surround sound, you know? And then um, you can, when I hit a button, it goes to preamp mode, which drives the amplifiers that are driving the speakers in your dedicated theater or your, or your media room. So yeah, it's basically two, two, two things in one. People say, I wish you had multi-zone, you know, you know, I want to be able to play, you know, surround sound out of zone two. Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah, so, so this is actually a pretty cool, um, cool, cool feature. Um, so, I mean, I, I love it. I think I think it's great. And like I said, it's that transition. Before I got the piece behind me, I have an AV8805. Um, I was using a uh, a receiver um, as a preamp, but like mm -hmm. I said, I want it, this allows me to optimize um, the performance. Um, so I can start off buying the amps, which I did. Bought the amps first, then I upgraded the receiver to a preamp. So, so, so if I'm remembering your feature matrix correctly, we're looking at the potential of having 13 channels of processing in a preamp mode on a receiver for 2,500 bucks. Yes. yes. That's pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most people are still looking at a note. Most, most other companies don't go past 11 when you talk about yeah. an ABR, you know? So now we're giving, we're bringing the 13 channel processing down from that 8,500 price point. Yep. Almost in half. We cut it in half almost, right? You know? uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's becoming more and more attainable. Buy more speakers. It's like Oprah. You get a speaker. You get a speaker. You get a speaker. <laughs> keep adding yeah. speakers. We'll keep adding processing. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So I think we should talk about the third feature that is another uh, kind of game changer for people that like to configure and they like to have the possibility of different audio modes. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us what this is about? Okay. So that is actually called. Um, dual speaker preset. So let's talk about what that is. So the, what this allows you to do is like in my home, um, there's, uh, there's, I have a 75 inch TV, which is what the camera's projected at right now. And normally I use that during the day or when the kids when we want the lights on. And I also have a 12 foot sliding door. And during the day, of course, the curtains are open because this kind of has an ocean view. So curtains open, flat panel TV is going to have a major impact on the sonics in the room. At night, when I close my heavy blackout curtains and I drop my 120 inch screen, that has a major impact on the acoustics. So before, when I run an Odyssey, I could run a full Odyssey setup and make my adjustments for, um, for, the, for the, uh, the, uh, the daytime viewing. And then I could go in and run another Odyssey using a multi-EQ app for my nighttime but every time I wanted to switch, I had to go back into the app and reload the configurations from the app into the uh, receiver or reload it from a USB. That's kind of a, it could be done, but it's, it's kind of a hassle. Now you can do it from a, um, I, a button push. So basically by pushing one button on the remote or discrete code or control system, it will switch between those two. The next scenario you could use is um, I play a lot of, sometimes I'm up here by myself and I may want to make a perfect sweet spot, which only for me, I do the eight, mm -hmm. you still want to do your eight positions of Odyssey measurements, but then I go in and I make this thing, I may turn up the surrounds a little bit more because where they're located, um, I want, it'll sound better to me. But if I use that same thing, and when I when people are sitting on my 12 foot couch, the person closest to that other surround sound is going to get his that rear surround may get his head blown off. So I may have to adjust that so it's comfortable for everybody on the couch and they all get a great experience. I can save both of those. Um, me watching movie by myself mode and me having a party or Super Bowl mode or or family movie night mode, and I can save both of those. Um, the other cool thing you could do too is you can do a full range EQ versus just EQing uh, at, at and below the room transition frequency, oh, and you can instantaneously compare which one you like better. Exactly. And 
on top of that, um, let me give you a, another scenario. We have been Gene has been on a war path about <laughs> about the center about the center spread going away. Way well, went away. Well, I'm gonna kill you. And he's give yelling at Yamada, Give it back. He's yelling at Dobie. He's yelling at Yamada San over at uh, at dinner. And he's yelling at everybody. Why don't this work? So so this is another solution for you. So what you can do is remember, if you look at the assignments, you can do speaker configurations, amps, levels, crossovers, everything. So you can go in, and if you if there's too much center, you can make it. Um, I want to use pick your pick your up mixer, you know, RO3D, um, Adobe Atmos, whichever one you want to do. I could take I could turn the center down or take the center out, change mm -hmm. the base adjustments, change the crossover adjustments, use a different EQ setting. And save that and make that my ultimate uh, um, two-channel up mixer. And then I can do a regular surround sound calibration and have a traditional ultimate surround sound theater mode. So you can actually go in and customize like that. So yes, it's gone, but this solution allows you to do, a, gives you so much flexibility, it's, it's unreal. And... Like I said, it's simple to do. You can do it. There's multiple ways to do it. I'll show you. You can switch from the menu. You can switch from the um, the options menu. When you hit the options button, another, a, a smaller menu comes up. Or you can um, use our quick select buttons. You save it. Um, you do all the configurations, and you save it under quick select number one. And then you do another one, and you save it for quick select number two. So you can actually you, – so you have the ability to do that. So lots and you of can ways. still save. You can still save these files to a USB drive too, right? Exactly, exactly. All we're doing is giving you the ability to do it um, this way. So if I go back into this receiver, right? If you look above that preamp mode, like right now, you'll see a, a parentheses right next to the den, and it says preset number one. So what I'm yeah. doing is I can go in here and I can say, okay, um, amp assign uh, preset number one. I want it to be. Uh, 13 channels with a top surround and a, a center height. I want my um, so so that's the one that I that I wanted to do. Or I can do um, uh, no surround music mode, whatever I want to do, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would save that. Now, when I go back here, you'll see that it says um, at the bottom it says speaker preset. So mm -hmm. now I want to switch from one to two. Now, when I go back here and I go back to amp assign, you see at the top it says speaker preset two next mm -hmm. to the denim. When I hit amp assign, I got it in preamp mode. So, nice. so I can have one running in preamp mode and one running in um in a in amplify like you talked about your two, your two hey, yep, rooms. and then EQ them separately. Yeah, yeah. Or I can go in so here if I wanted to. And I could put in a different a different thing. Like I can go in and and uh and we'll do the other 13 channel. So I can go in here and do this one. So so which so I can pick, you know. So it's it's kind of cool. Now so go, before, go back to go back to preset one where you had it at 13.1 because I wanted to show I wanted to point out something that I that okay. I noticed. Okay. So let me let me clear this. So in, in this receiver, it's got 11 amplifier channels, but it's got 13 channels of processing, correct? Exactly. Exactly. So hold okay, on a second. So, so in this one, you would basically do like a, um, I would, okay, so let's go in here. So preset yeah, number preset one. one. And then we come out of there. And then we go back up here under preset number one. And I hit amp assign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so check this out. Somebody at Denon was listening when I complained. <laughs> because in the past when you had more channels of processing than you have than you had internal amplification, mm -hmm. that pre-assign would go to like surround channels. Yeah. And now, now you can change it. You can change now it. you have it to the front channels. I can change which it. Is awesome. Oh, you so can I change can it. Yeah. So front, this is incredible uh, because now uh, now you have full preamp capability. It's disconnected from the amp. It will not clip. It will not have that distortion I was talking about. Yeah, you could yeah. run a really heavy loaded amp to the front channels and then still exactly. use the internal amps mm -hmm. in the den and receiver. This is this is really freaking awesome. Yeah. I, have to tell I mean, you, I'm excited I mean about we, it. we keep trying to listen. 
um, to to uh, to people to try to enhance and can, and continue to improve the performance. Um, and I think this is kind of just another example um, of that. And, and like I said, um, most people what, what they're going to do is they're going to have one configuration for both, but they'll probably go in like Eugene. You would probably say um, you would have say you're using this configuration for everything, right? Because you mm -hmm. like it. And then you were like, man, I really hate that center channel. Uh, you would probably go in and uh, after you leave here, go over to the other one and turn um, one of the other settings and turn the center channel down because right. or, or turn everything else up and, turn you know, to get the sound that you want it. So you would you can go in here, even if you use the same layout for preset one and preset two, you, it's, it could be EQ different. It could be um, the different things like the crossover settings. I can go in here to the configuration. And if I go into configuration, I can literally change the crossover settings or the size of the speakers um, yeah. or whatever I want to do um, in here. So all the different features are available here. So if I go back into, um, so say we go to levels, um, there's a level for this. So I can turn the, the center down. So I can really go in and get it exactly the way I want it. And as long as it's under that preset one parentheses, everything that you change here from the crossover to um, the crossovers, do you want them to be individual or all? What crossover frequencies do you want? Do you want the L do you want bass and LFE together or not? All that stuff can be adjusted. So I you want know? to address this comment because it's incorrect. Um, yeah. When you're running 13 channels and not turning off the preamp mm -hmm. or not going into preamp mode, you still have preamp disconnect on those main channels or any channels you want. It's whatever channels you want to assign for those extra two amplification channels. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really, I want people to understand this. So if you're using the 11 internal amplifiers of the 6700, you still need a two channel amp to get 13 channels of processing. Mm -hmm. You could assign which channels you want that to be the preamp disconnect mode or which yeah. which channels you wanna amplify externally. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so what he's, yeah. So basically when I said all or nothing, that means if you're using like right now, I am using all the amplifiers, right? Right. And I have to have a preamp. If I go to the preamp mode, they're it they're all off. There's all or nothing. So so yes. it's either all the amplifiers on with a second external amplifier, or you know, all the amplifiers off, and you got to get amplification. You got to get amplification for every channel. So that's what mm -hmm. Gene was trying to say. Awesome. Okay. So those are the those are the three differentiating features. And and before we move on, I wanted to kind of comment quickly about the center channel thing. I know I kind of harp on this. This is just an issue that I notice when you're up mixing two channel music with the Dolby surround up mixer. This is not a problem when you have discrete 5.1 or above. Mm -hmm. And I did finally get a little bit more information about it. It's not that Dolby necessarily is removing the center spread feature. It's that with the new licensing, if you have a receiver that has height virtualization, it's either you have height virtualization or you have center spread. Currently, you can't have both implemented into a receiver. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to see if Dolby can turn that back on. But even if they don't, you guys have a great solution here where you can knock the center channel down when you're up mixing two channel music through the speaker presets or through all those those other two options that you showed. Exactly. Exactly. So um, it's just we want to give we want to give the people more flexibility. Um, it's always funny whenever we introduce a new mo a new mode. The first question anybody asks is, "Can I turn it off?" You know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> look, it it makes it levitates. Can I turn it off? You know, so, 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 so we try to give so no one has ever complained about having more controls. Of course, it defaults in a way that um, it sounds great, but um, we always give you the ability to turn it off. Um, so just, just to recap the three, the three features that we're getting in your entire product line that currently are the only ones that have is the DTS X pro mm -hmm. the, the preamp mode, the dual preset mode. But mm -hmm. also, if you think about it, I'm not aware of, of other um, receivers having HDMI 2.1 capability through their entire product line. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I'll, I'll, well, actually, starting 2.1 starts at what level? 2600, Jake? And up for 8K. Um, 2700. Yeah, the 2700. 2, yeah. yeah. And that, now, the ones that were reduced last year are not are, are still going to continue to ones below 1600 bucks. But let's be honest. Um, and I was actually going to talk about that a few seconds, a few minutes about 
2.1 because there's the HDMI diagnostics that's in here and show you guys the back and stuff like that as well. But um, but the the average 8K TV that's available, manufacturers are talking about them, TV manufacturers are talking about them a lot, but the average 8K TV that's available for most manufacturers, they have maybe two or three out of the 60 they sell. And most mm -hmm. of those TVs start at about five thousand dollars, and the most the average is about eight thousand dollars. If you're connecting a five hundred dollar or six hundred dollar receiver to an eight thousand dollar TV, we need to have a conversation, okay? So, so, <laughs> so, um, we uh, it if you look at it, the price that we start is really where someone who would probably be buying a flagship television set. It's probably the minimum that they would probably buy as a new AVR to go along with it. So, right. so keep that in mind. And also, remember the 8500. We're going to do some upgrades on 8500. So the 8500 is um, that's already available is going to be able to be upgraded to HDMI 2.1, and we are adding DTSX Pro. Now, dual speaker preset, and um, and uh, what was the other one, Jake? Uh, uh, actually, it already has preset mode. The only thing that 8500 is not going to get of the two we of the things we talked about so far is the dual speaker preset. The processor is just not designed; is it doesn't think that way. So, um, but but the DTSX Pro we talked about, the HDMI 2.1 um, that we that we talk about, as well as the um, what was the other one, Jake? The preamp mode. Pre mode. Those yeah. are those are those are already there. But real quick, I want to cover 2.1. Because there's a few things that I didn't talk about last time that I think we should get, need to get across pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So we know there's a new standard, and the standard is basically because of the bandwidth requirements. You can get a lot of the audio stuff, a lot of the gaming stuff, and a lot of user experience stuff could have been done with, with, minimum with a minimal increase in bandwidth. It's just that when you add 8K content and you add 120 frames per second to run these types of systems, these game systems, and things like that, the bandwidth is massive. Um, and that is why you had to go. You need a new standard to go from 18 gigabits per second, which is the bandwidth, up to a maximum of, like we said, 48. So 48 is the maximum bandwidth of this new 2.1 specification, which you won't see 2.1. You'll see ultra, ultra high speed or people will put the speed of their particular receivers and processors on them. So you'll probably just see ultra, ultra high speed or support for 8K, 60, 4K, 120. But 48 is the maximum. And I... And um, LG got beat up a little bit over um, the fact that someone said, wow, it only does 40. Well, there's some things we got to talk about. And I want people to really understand this, is people get obsessed with big numbers, but a lot of times you don't get much more. Um, this, let's talk reality. The panels that are in an OLED or an LCD or 99% of computer monitors are 10-bit panels. There are no consumer 12-bit TVs, period, okay? There's one manufacturer that makes a 12-bit um, projector, they say their panel, their images are 12 bit, which is JVC, but they aren't doing 8K and they aren't doing 120 frames per second. So the, anything that's going to be doing 8K or 4K 120 is a 10 bit device. All right. Now, if I take 4K 120 at 10 bit with 444 sampling, it's 40 gigabits per second. Oh, by the way, 444 is just how many times you sample the color, and 10 bit is the number you assign the color that has been sampled. All right. Um, if I look at 8K24, I'm a movie guy. If you're not, if you're not a gamer, you, people don't like high, um, ultra high frame rate movies. Our, um, directors keep trying, but we seem to like our movies at 24. It has this cinematic look. And if I crank the movie to to 8K24 frames per second, 10 bit 444, the maximum that that panel can support, the number is 40. If I go to 4, 8K60, there is no 10-bit 444 standard for uncompressed for 8K60. It uses a 420 color space. And the maximum number, drum roll please, is 40. So to get the maximum from the TV is 40. The next thing is the gaming consoles, you can crank them up to 12 bits and all that type of stuff. But the gaming consoles also have a HDMI board in them. And the boards that they're going to be using can support four channels at 10 gigabits per second. And that includes high in gaming cards and high in gaming consoles, which means the same 40. So if the input is 40, th what comes out of the source is only going to be at a maximum 40. And the TV can't do more than, it, than, than, um, 
uh, display you more than what you would get from 40, the actual speed limit that you need to truly be concerned with right now for the next several years is actually 40. Mm -hmm. If a customer, if, if a TV manufacturer makes 48, that's great. But you have to ask yourself if the TV can accept 40 and you're doing 48, that means you made a one-off video processing circuitry board, not buying the <laughs> ones that are available, which meant you increased the cost of the TV um, to give you the 40 number. Instead of giving you a better backlight system, a better video processor, a better cabinet, or better speakers. So to me, um, you got to think about that type of stuff. Are they really – TV manufacturers try to utilize the money the best way they possibly can, and yeah. going out and randomly just throwing in 48 because the number looks good may not have been – the would not probably be the best business decision when they can utilize um, that to give you better performance someplace else. All right. So a question for you on the 8K um... – capability is it every hdmi input is 8k or is it oh, limited to we'll talk about that in a second um okay. the, the the next thing that we want to up that i get cut off there we go here switch oh my thing is acting up oh there we go come back of course my computer went away the uh the, the one thing i wanted to get to and of course my computer is acting up let me unplug and plug it back in i want to talk about we have an hdmi diagnostics tool yes. and the hdmi diagnostics tool um, will allow you to, there we go. Let's go back here. We've always had one. The old one supported, um, the old one supported up to 18. The new one supports up to 40 because that's what the chip in the receiver does. Um, but guess what? That means all you can get out of your game system, the only sources that are going to be available and all you can get out of that. You can get your TV can maximize and display. So you can test your cables and all of your switches and stuff up to the maximum that modern displays can actually utilize, okay? And it's um, and so basically it's the same type of process. Oh, and by the way, the only other way to um, to test this is with a seven a Neridio seven G, which costs about five thousand dollars. So the fact that we're including this in a in our receiver starting with the twenty seven hundred is pretty freaking powerful. All right. Yeah. So, so you basically just so you guys understand, you um you buy these receivers and you could literally do an HDMI diagnostic on all your cables before you install them. I mean, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. That's really oh, yeah. awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of any integrators are probably just going to use a dinner receiver because it's cheaper to take mm -hmm. to buy a dinner receiver to test all their cables than to buy any third party signal tester that's available on the market. Think about that. Mm -hmm. How much is a Jake? How much and is a 2700 cost? I was going to say this goes from the 67 top of the line all the way down to the 2700, which is at 849. So, 849. So yeah, you can buy a dinner receiver for 849. Or you could buy a seven thousand dollar test pattern generator to test your cables. Very <laughs> slick. Very slick. I mean, come come on, come on. It's it's pretty powerful. So yeah. let's look at the back of this thing, because you were asking. So mm -hmm. this is actually the back of the sixty seven hundred, um, and like I said, it has uh, thirteen speaker outputs. I mean, it has like your your optional different types of heights and everything else, and then you have your multiple um, all of your your. I mean, it has eleven speaker terminals and thirteen pre-outs, all right? You can use 11 at a time of the terminals that are available. If you look at the HDMI board, the HDMI boards, the way they work out is like this. There is eight in, like say if you move, depending on what you buy, the amount of HDMIs that are NZs and outsies increase. So if I go to the 47 and the 67, I get eight ends, including one front input and three outputs, a zone two, as well as um, two uh, outs for your main theater. There's one 40 gigabit per second HDMI input and two um, 40 gigabit per, bit per second 8K HDMI outputs. So one in 8K and two outs that are 8K. Now, so in, in, the, in, the, in the conceivable future, when I have my flying car that you keep talking about mm -hmm. and we have more than one source that does 8K, you don't necessarily have to ditch this receiver because we'll have eARC and exactly. you can plug those AK sources into your display and still transmit the audio back to the AVR. Exactly. So that's what people say. Why is eARC so important and make sure you get good cables because um, you can start off doing this. You can start off with either say you have a um, say you have the, the first 8K movie 
um, content is probably going to be internal applications because Sony, Samsung, LG are probably going to sponsor some footage that they can actually display. And you're going to need to send the audio to the receiver via eARC to get the uncompressed audio. If you end up with a way more, there's only two op, two two sources. Worst comes to worst, you plug one in the TV and one into the uh, directly into the AVR and you use eARC. So no, you won't have to ditch this receiver. So this receiver will live in the in the system for a long, long time. But the main thing we have to remember is is all those other features that we talk about when it comes to um, HDMI um, HDMI 2.1. That whether you have an 8K TV or not give you benefit, dynamic HDR, um, HDR10+, plus, Dolby Vision, variable refresh rate, quick media switching, all the stuff we've talked about before, Gene. So you guys mm -hmm. who have it, you don't know that, should go check out those other earlier sessions. Now, all the inputs support that, okay? So while there's only one 8K input to support the high bandwidth of 40, all the other inputs support all of those other enhancements, variable refresh rate, quick media switching, all that stuff, okay? And... All of the other inputs, the other seven inputs can be upscaled from HD or 4K up to 8K you inside, um, using the TV's internal upscaler. Yeah, you guys are you're really getting a high end HDMI switcher with these receivers. We oh, yeah. did uh, we did a three part HDMI 2.1 um, presentation on YouTube over the last couple of weeks. And you guys I'll link them up in the description. You guys should definitely check that out. Phil just poured out the technology, man. We did like three 45 minute presentations on it. So all that information is there. I don't want to rehash too much exactly. of it here. Yeah, I'm just trying to cover some of the newer stuff. So, so for example, these are the backs. So if you look at the back, this is the back of a 6700. And you'll see that there's um, a total of seven inputs on the back. And then there's one on the front for a total of eight, right? One of the seven numbers um, ha is labeled 8K. That's the input that will um, handle the higher bandwidth. Then you have your zone two. And then you have your two outputs, your monitor one and your monitor two for your TV and your projector in your main room. Um, that is what you're going to see. When uh, when we upgrade to 8500, it's going to go from the X8500H to the X8500HA. And basically, the, the, the sticker below is what it will look like on the back of that receiver. If you buy, if you already have an 8500 or you buy one right now and you decide you want to send that receiver off for the upgrade, when they replace the board, um, uh, you will also, they will also replace the sticker so you know, um, so it matches. So basically it's the same board. And by the time the board is ready to be, um, uh, for the upgrade, it's about the same time that the ones with the, their board already in it will be hitting stores. Nice. That's slick. So I wanted to just do a quick follow-up. We got a confirmation from Denon Engineering that when you do put it in preamp mode, it automatically switches to eco on. So okay. you're consuming less power. That's that's good to hear. And then the 8500 ha does have auto switching capability for the 15 channel configuration. Awesome, awesome. So oh, I want to beat you up. I want to be. I want to beat you up on something first. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I, it looks like you're still putting those little stickers on the front of your receivers where you boast, unre uh, you know, real mm -hmm. unrealistic power uh, yeah. power numbers. This is a one channel driven six yeah. ohm, ten percent. Yeah. The reality yeah. is it's 140 watts. Yeah. Or so let's, 100... let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, yeah. uh, unfortunately, like you guys know that, but mm -hmm. if you walk into a retail store and, ev and everybody else has the big number and they aren't educated, they walk right by the other receivers. So if they put that one channel driven number on it, in order to be honestly competitive, we have to. But Jake, can you talk about the guarantee? I think we have like a guarantee thing coming yeah. up. Can you yes. explain that? Definitely. So we have a seven channel guarantee. So that makes sure that, or I'm sorry, a 70% uh, guarantee on that. So across all the channels on that board, we're going to guarantee that you're able to hit 70% at bare minimum across, um, say, for example, on the uh, 6700 that will come out. We posted at 140. So this guarantees 70 percent um power guaranteed uh five channel driven yeah so yeah. if you so yeah because we have to um you guys know that and we'll make and we'll like you said and, and we know reviewers are going to check it we know that you guys are going to say exactly what all channels driven are um though it will be listed in the um 
in the documents and we'll give you the 70 percent guarantee but the fact is that sticker on the front of that receiver is to make somebody excited about that product and if they see the big number and everybody else there's not someone there at a normal best buy store or a normal retailer to tell them that that is that oh the the, the denon is measuring all channels driven while the fill in the blank is not so yeah. um you know what I mean? So we have to be so, yes, we will be honest with you that that does not mean all the channels are being driven at the same time. But that is a marketing thing you're going to peel off because you know exactly what the number is going to be. And, you know, yeah, and, and, you know, all of the Denon and Marantz receivers that I've reviewed, because I do measure all channels driven up to seven channels. I've I've been able to confirm that you guys actually meet that 70 percent power rating with actually up to seven channels driven from my testing yes. especially with the, the sr8012 for example exceeded that because it has a really big power supply exactly if you look at the 8500 the power transformer in the 8500 weighs the same as an x1600 receiver mm -hmm. so we go out of our way to try to give you as much current to give you as much power on all of your channels okay but at the yeah. same time um we are we have to sell receivers mm -hmm. to, to people who are not as informed as and, the audio hall of the team and phil right. and gene uh i think a great point to put to that is those stickers that you see that when you're looking through the shelves going on the market we've actually taken those down from these astronomically high numbers like 260 watts that are for one channel driven so um now they are at a more reasonable usually around like the two channel with the thd at like or I'm sorry, eight ohms with a THD at like oh, uh, 0 0.05 to make it more realistic for the consumer to yeah. take it. Yeah. So uh, it's not one time before it yeah. blows up power that's listed on the <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not your one. While it's driving a square wave. <laughs> yep. Exactly, yep. exactly. Now there was one more thing I wanted to point out before, before we leave too. And one more point that's important. We talk about the value of these things being built in. And Gene, you mentioned that this receiver is almost like a test pattern generator built in. And I said, you know, you could buy an $8,000, $7,000 generator. The radio makes a great five to $6,000 generator. It's called a 7G. It's a great piece. Um, but most customers aren't going to buy that. Now, the next thing is we have all this bandwidth stuff, but there's all these other cool features coming through HDMI 2.1. But not all TVs support all of the features and not mm -hmm. all sources output all of the features. So how do you know if I connect these two devices, what is can be supported by both devices? Well, remember, the receiver is a repeater. It's between the source, your game system, and the sync, which is your display. So it could actually read that information. So the new Minsk, Min, I can't show you this right now because there is no device that exists right now, but mm -hmm. um, except for high-end test pattern generators. But I can actually go in, and if I hit the info button, it'll tell me if it's HDMI. I mean, what type of HDMI? What type of Dolby Vision? I mean, what type of HDR? Is it HDR10, Dolby Vision, HOG, HDR10, or the new dynamic HDR, which is part of the 2.1 standard? It'll give me my resolutions. And up to, you know, is it, 4, is it 4K 120, is it 8K 24, is it 8K 60? Or remember, game systems use variable refresh rate. So there is no 8K 24, it's 8K VRR, which means the refresh rate, refresh rate is changing. So by just hitting the menu system, instead of having to buy a test pattern generator or hope the TV is not going to show you this stuff, the, 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 I guarantee you the source is not going to show you this stuff because we can read the signal going through us. We can provide you with that information. So we, we are real because most of the time it is a problem. They blame the black box. So the black box can now tell you the reason why you're not getting VRR is because something is not sending VRR down the line. We're not involved. So check your TV and check your source. Don't blame the repeater, which is us. Sweet. So okay. guys, I do have I do have the whole procedure on how to put it in HDMI diagnostic mode for all the Denon and Marantz receivers. It's on our Patreon channel. So if you're a Patreon member, we, we put that all there, easily digestible. I'm also going to be putting a very detailed slides presentation on all the feature sets of this of these uh, new receivers for Denon on our Patreon channel if you become a member. So if you want to go further into this, because we can only cover so much, and we've been on for an hour already, but we've got even more information. I've also, I'll be putting an article up on Audioholic sometime today with the editorial on the overview of these products. And we have an exciting announcement that we're going to be making here. Um, I'm going to let you actually 
kind of uh, say what's going on. We're going to be doing a contest giveaway on which receiver. Do you guys know for a fact <laughs> which receiver we're going to be giving away to audio? I'll leave that to Jake. He's the dinner oh, manager. man. <laughs> what do you want, Gene? What do you want? I mean, I, I think it would be overkill to do a 6,700. We don't want to give these guys too much. But I really, I really believe because – I'll tell you this much, the 3,600, when we did that re, uh, that video on YouTube last mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. and we linked it up with our Amazon affiliate, we, those things were flying off the shelves. It's clear mm -hmm. to me that the 3,600 was the best selling receiver of your product line last year, unless I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. It just, that's it the data that I saw. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh so, yeah, it is. So why not do a 3,700? I think that's a good, that gives you a good feature set on every capability mm -hmm. that you want to be that yeah. Audio Hawks would want to have with speaker layouts and the preamp and all that stuff. How about this one, Gene? I will guarantee a 2700. And if everybody goes to the Sound United training page um, on yeah. YouTube and subscribe, subscribe I'll upgrade that up to a 37 yeah. for you. If we get more viewers like on my Sound United YouTube page, mm -hmm. okay, and we get a, I will. Well, how many are you at? Um, we are at right about right about a thousand. So if yeah. we get another. Two two hundred, and there's enough okay. people between that watch this recording, that are watching this, that are going to watch these other sessions. I should get two hundred other people, and um, and half the stuff they're asking me in the comments, I answer mm -hmm. on that page about the Morant's upgrades and mm -hmm. and all of this other stuff. So go there, subscribe, and if we get some more subscriptions, I'll I, upgrade I, it for I, you. Yeah, I can go talk <laughs> to the boss. We can go talk to the boss and say, yep. look. Gene upped us, audio holics or fans. We should up that. We should raise the prizes. So I'll put a link to I'll put a link to your Sound United training in the description here, and I'll also put it on the editorial on audio holics. Mm -hmm. Guys, I mean, come on, do it. This is what a twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollar receiver, and it's got all the latest features. Mm -hmm. We're going to be announcing the contest on audio holics in the coming weeks, mm -hmm. and um, also you guys are going to be doing a broadcast on our partner channel, Spare Change and New Record Day. I think tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think yes. spare change is at two p.m. Yes, yes, Eastern we'll time. Yeah. yeah, and then, and we'll um, and the the topics will be a little different today. We talked more about surround sound type applications. Um, I think one we're going to talk. They haven't really talked much about the video side of things, so we'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about the video and the HDMI and the bandwidth stuff on one, and then the other one will be more about maximizing performance for playing two channel type stuff. So awesome. it'll be. So it'll it'll so you'll get new it'll be new information. It will not be a repeat of what we just talked about today. Yeah, we believe in doing unique content for all the channels. We don't do a, a multi-stream for everybody. I think that's lame. Mm -hmm. So um Jake, I'm gonna volunteer you on something because we're getting a ton <laughs> of questions in here. Yeah. And obviously, you know these products better than me since I don't even have them on hand. So if you can go in over the next day or two and just answer some of the common questions, I, I would really appreciate you guys just kind of following yeah. up with our fans. Yes, yes. definitely. I'll and, take care of that one. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So um, again, to follow up, we're going to be doing a contest. It depends if we're going to go 30, the 2700 or 3700. If you guys subscribe to the sound United training, this is all, up, this is all up to you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep it up. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, Phil, Jake, thank you for being here. Thanks for dropping all this knowledge on your new receiver line. This looks incredible guys. Make sure you join our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. Take care, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone.